My name is Lee Bellman, and I've been a Temple member since 2012, and along with my wife, Carolyn Kaniski, and my daughter, Eleanor. And I'm going to be talking about the Book of Jonah. I am a professor of English at Montclair State University. Mainly, I teach 19th century and write about 19th century British uh, literature. Um, but occasionally, I get the opportunity to teach a class on the Hebrew Bible um, or Tanakh in translation. And I do love, love this material. I'm not a scholar of the Bible, um, but um, I want to talk today about um, mainly about a couple of these things. Why, why, do you, why do I think Jonah has been included uh, as the main um, Haftorah reading uh, for Yom Kippur? What, what the, might the rabbis have been up to uh, in including this as the text? I think there, there are a couple of reasons I can think of. Um, and I also want to think about the book of Jonah in the context of um, what are often called call narratives in the Hebrew Bible. Um, this is a relatively late text, Jonah. Um, it, based on linguistic analysis, it seems to be written in a Hebrew that came well after the, the return from the Babylonian exile, so sometime after the 400s BC, um, perhaps as late as the 200s BC. Um, and so this is, this is coming after other prophetic and other, other texts in the Hebrew Bible, and very much is kind of responding to them in interesting ways. It's a very short text. It's only four chapters long. Um, and if you don't know it, it's the story of a man um, who's an Israelite, uh, Judite uh, from Jerusalem, who's called by God to go save the people of Nineveh, to preach to them, to be a prophet. And he resists and uh, literally goes the other direction from where God tells him. He's eventually... Uh, she has to get away on a ship. He's thrown overboard and swallowed up by a big fish, sometimes translated as a whale. Um, and after three days, after calling out to God, he's saved by God. And then finally goes to Nineveh and at least starts to go on a mission of saving these people. A couple of things to say about Jonah is um, it's kind of written like a folktale. It doesn't, it's not written sort of like history, some like some of the other biblical texts. And um, it's a story that, ends somewhat abruptly, and we'll talk about that that ending. So I want to talk about the very beginning of the story about uh, the, the, the big fish episode uh, and the very end of the story uh, today. So um, with regard to the issue of the call, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, to be a, a prophet is to be one who's called by God, to be uh, like Eliyahu Hanavi means Eliyahu the prophet, he was called. That's what it means literally in Hebrew. It doesn't mean somebody who tells the future. It's actually a lot more than that. A prophet is somebody who, who uh, is a conduit for God's voice, um, who more often con is sort of talking about current events and what's gone wrong. And the prophet typically confronts a figure in power. Um, what uh, Jonah does in some ways is very much in keeping with those earlier stories about prophets, but it also goes to sort of almost ridiculous and perhaps comic extremes. But let's talk about these prophet call narratives. So uh, the first one I want to bring up with you is a figure who's not usually thought of as a prophet, uh, and this is Abraham. Um, so in Genesis 12, when we first see Abraham, God calls upon Abraham and says, uh, he says, get up, go, get up and go. <laughs> uh, get thee out of thy country and from thy kin kindred. Right? He's from um, the Mesopotamia. And from thy father's house unto the land that I will show thee. And he makes these promises, of course, about uh, you bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And this is the land that will be your inheritance. Eventually, we find out uh, later on that it's not going to be immediately be your inheritance. It's going to be the inheritance of your your uh, your descendants. But God doesn't give him that part of the story quite yet. Um, anyway, um, and what does Abraham do? Well, he's actually Abram now. He's not, before he even gets the name of Abraham. And Abraham went. He doesn't say a thing. He just goes. Actually, that's going to be something he, interestingly he holds in common with with Jonah. They don't. Both of them don't say anything at first. Uh, and this is this shows you he's a kind of proto prophet figure here. He literally is called by God, and he immediately goes and shows how it, you know Abraham is a is a is a follower of God. He's a good man um, who goes where he's told to go. So this is the first sort of prophetic or proto prophetic kind of story. Um, Let's turn now to Moses, uh, who often is thought of as a kind of prophet figure, perhaps the first one in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and he's, he's called upon by God uh, shortly after he's left the land of Egypt. He's, he's, he's slain the, 
the Egyptian taskmaster who has been abusing an Israelite, buried the body, and he's afraid. And he comes upon um, in this new land, the, the, the burning bush, and God calls out to him. God gives him his mission, just like before with Abram. Uh, and says, come, I will send thee unto Pharaoh. Thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses says, <laughs> and this is the kind of first more complex response from a prophet figure. Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God comforts him and says, don't worry, I'll be with you, and I'll tell you what to say, and I'll give you these words. And it becomes this long back and forth. Now, one way of, of reading this is um, it's a kind of modesty trope or position. Or saying, I, don't, I don't deserve this. I, I, don't, I don't know that I can be the voice of God. I don't know that I can be a conduit for this responsibility, and I'm, I'm not worthy of it. Um, which makes makes a lot of sense. Uh, got, what's what's wonderful about this whole passage is they go to Moses goes to extreme lengths to avoid this responsibility, and God has to repeatedly comfort him. Uh, in fact, by the beginning of the next chapter, this is in chapter four of Exodus, uh, Moses famously says, "You know, I'm I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue," um, which probably means he has a kind of speech impediment. And there are some midrashim, some post-biblical stories that explain, uh, purport to explain how we got that speech impediment. There's some wonderful stories about that. Anyway, and God says, who, you know, responds, who made your mouth? Who made men dumb or deaf or seeing blind? Am I, am I, it's not I, I, I made you. I can handle this. Um, and again, Moses resists. And finally, God gets angry with Moses. And he says, you know, fine, I'll send your, you know, your brother can talk for you. You'll be, he'll be your, he'll be your Moses. And just as you're my prophet, he'll be your prophet and speak to Pharaoh for you. Uh, you tell him what to say, he'll say it. So one of the things the Moses story does is it sets up a, as a kind of precedent when God calls upon a prophet to be the conduit for God's voice and God's word, uh, the prophet typically resists, okay? One of the reasons, perhaps a political reason, why they might resist or a human reason is it's a tough gig. Um, Moses is going to have to confront the figure in power here. He's going to have to confront Pharaoh. Um, the story of Elijah. Elijah actually has to flee, uh, and you know, from from the current king and queen of his time, um, and hide out because they're trying to kill him. Like it's really hard. You have to confront, in some cases, the, the the king and queen, or just the king of of Israel or Judah when you're a prophet, and they they they're sinning. You're telling them they're sinning and they're bad. And so it's not an easy job. It's not a fun gig uh, to be a prophet. Although you have this, you, know, you get to have the voice of God, of course. Let's take a look at uh, too quickly at two classic prophets, later prophets, or class classical figures. So here's Jeremiah. Uh, the crankiest prophet, uh, and God says to him, before he even gives him the task, God says, before I form thee in the belly, right? The, presumably the belly of his mother, but think about belly when we get to the belly of the whale or the, the fish later on with Jonah. I came thee, I sanctified thee, I made you a prophet unto the nations, unto all the people. This is a kind of a hint at a kind of universalism that we're going to see made good on later on um, in Jonah. And Jonah says, typically, by now, I cannot speak for I am a child. And God responds, um, don't say that. I'm going to give you what to say. And I'll tell you I'll tell you what to say. And, and God does the sanctification thing where he puts forth his hand and touches his mouth. And God puts words in his mouth. So there's this giving of the speech to the prophet figure. Um, and an even more developed version of this is in First Isaiah, in chapter 6, um, of Isaiah, God appears to Isaiah, and there's this, Isaiah has vision of God in the temple appearing to him um, of the Holy of Holy, Kadosh, 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 right? Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of Hosts, um, and uh, <laughs> and then he sort of sees these sort of special effects. The, the house, the, the house of God, the temple is filled with smoke. And he says, Isaiah says, I'm undone. Woe is me, because I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't speak your words because I'm a sinner. Okay, I dwelt in the midst of a people of unclean lips. We're all sinners. Um, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. He can't handle it. Uh, and what happens is, is that a coal is taken <laughs> from the altar in the temple and is, is brought to his lips. And it it's cauterizes him. Uh, it seals his lips. And he is given the power of speech 
um, and his iniquity and his sin is expiated. Now, interesting when we think about this as a kind of metaphor, um, it seems that you know to be to be given the task of speaking for God, you have to have this kind of transformation, this cauterization of your lips, so that you can speak the word of God. You're purified, um, and I would also add that it's painful to be a human conduit for the voice of God. Maybe a, a challenging and even unnatural thing, and uh, it hurts. It hurts to be the prophet. And in fact, when God gives Isaiah his prophetic mission, it doesn't sound like a fun gig. He says, go and tell the people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye, but perceive not. And what he's telling is, really is that you're going to go out and you're going to preach to the, to the Israelites, and they're not going to listen. They're not going to listen. In fact, they're going to they're going to lose. They're going to lose the land. The Babylonians are going to invade, and you're going to lose, and, you know, uh, lose, lose Judah, at least for a time. And so you're actually not going to succeed, but I'm somehow still giving you this task because there'll be a remnant. It's some still shall be a holy seed. And eventually you'll, you'll, you'll help guide this remnant of the people. So God is giving the prophet, sometimes God gives the prophet a, a, a failed task, or at least what appears to be a failed task. Another way in which being a prophet is a tough gig. Okay. Now let's turn to our our text at hand, and that's the story of Jonah. And this is a very short text. It's only four chapters long, um, and you can read it in, you know, in a half hour. Uh, I recommend it. So here we go. We get, we get yet another call narrative. Now I hope you can see that this has become a kind of staple, all right? It's, it's, it's almost a cliche. Now the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. Okay, that's the first weird thing. You know, this is this giant city that's the capital of Assyria, which centuries earlier had conquered the north, had conquered Israel in 721 BC, scattered the 10 tribes, never to be found again. <laughs> and uh, they themselves were conquered by the Babylonians not longer afterwards in the next century. By the time this text is, is written, they're long gone. There's, so this is almost like a mythical place, but this is setting, this is being set in what is, you know, already a very distant past. Go to, it's like saying, go to, go to preach to your enemy. That's what it's saying. Go to preach to the really bad guys uh, and proclaim against it for their wickedness has come up before me. But he's actually going so he can save them. Um, and here's what Jonah is. Remember Abraham goes, immediately goes in the direction God sends. Jonah goes, he's being told to go east to Nineveh. Okay, he's in Jerusalem, presumably. Um, and he is, he leaves, rose, rose up and he goes to Tarshish, which is to the west. Okay, so he gets on a ship and goes, finds a ship to Tarshish in, in Joppa, the port. Uh, so he immediately, he does what Abraham does in reverse. Okay, so this is funny. I hope that can come through to you that this is a kind of parod parodic turn on the Abraham story, where he says, instead of getting up and going, he, well, he gets up and going, but he goes in the wrong direction. Okay, um, but you can't escape God. Your arms are too short to box with God. Uh, in this case, he can't, he can't flee. He gets on his ship. God sends a storm. And there's this wonderful uh, storytelling here where we get to see it from the point of view of the sailors who are all polytheists. And they don't know why there's a storm. And they figure somebody's responsible. They draw lots. And it turns out to be Jonah. And Jonah resignedly says, yeah, it's me. Just throw me in the sea. Get rid of me. So they throw him in the sea. And actually, they're good guys. They resist it at first. And, and Melville is really wonderful on this. In chapter 9 of Moby Dick, you kind of see it from the point of view of these sailors, too. But they throw him in the sea, and immediately the sea is becalmed, and he ends up in the belly of the giant fish for three days. Um, so a couple of things to say about this. One is, I mean, I think the the rabbis chose um, this as, as the haftarah for 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 Yom Kippur because it's clearly this kind of existential um, crisis this guy is going through. He's literally in the belly of the of the fish. He's in the darkness, and he. He speaks this um, psalm, really, and it probably came from an older psalm um, uh, that was kind of cut into this text, because it's not directly talking about a situation, but it can be seen to be metaphorically appropriate, where he says, God, I'm, I'm in shale, I'm in, I'm in the pit, I'm in, I'm in death, in, in the nothingness of death, and you saved me. Um, he actually hasn't been saved yet, but he's, he speaks like it has already happened. And he's there for three days and three nights. Um, and, you know, you know, during this time of, of Yom Kippur, um, we might feel that we're, you know, lost to we think about all the wrong that we've done. And we feel like we're in the belly of, of the fish or the whale, uh, like Jonah did. And in chapter two of Jonah, we actually get that psalm. 
uh, complete. And again, it doesn't talk about it doesn't talk about uh, uh, um, his specific situation about the fish, but he does say, "I'm, I'm in the deep waters, I'm in the pit, and I, 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 forsa I forsake you, but you see, you've saved me." So, um, and he says, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna sacrifice unto you." So this is also a kind of prayer. And one of the things that you can think about with Jonah is that um, Jonah's resistance to the call is like resisting. I mean, the call itself is is kind of like a reverse prayer, because of the prayer you want to reach out to God and find God and make this connection, um, have God come into your life. And Jonah, uh, with 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 the with the call from God to become a prophet, you don't even have to do that. God's already marked you out, like with with Jeremiah before you were born. I marked you out. I'm going to call unto you. Which is, you know, it's like the spotlight's on you. You're put in the spot. Okay, it's not a prayer. It's, it's, it's a uh, direct summons by God. And Jonah says, I don't want anything to do with this. And is he afraid? Uh, he has reason to be. Uh, he's going into enemy territory. Um, we actually find out a little bit about why he might he might have resisted later on. But um, certainly he, he'd be valid. It would be valid to be afraid. Maybe he's afraid of having his tongue burnt, like Isaiah does. Um, that's painful, right? Certainly challenging this authority, this enemy authority, where none of them believe in, in the Jewish God is painful. One of the things to say about this story, I think another reason why this, this is appropriate for Yom Kippur is it's very explicitly universalistic and monotheistic. Um, in, in keeping with some of the later uh, Hebrew Bible texts, it is uh, presenting a God as the God of all nations and not just the God of, of, of Israel. And this presents a kind of new challenge, which is how do we think about these bad guys, uh, these these people from Syria, these Ninevites? Uh, aren't they worthy of, of God's word as well? And, and what we see, actually, if you turn to the next chapter, is that Jonah really didn't want that task. And so God, you know, you think that all has been resolved, but Jonah is still resistant. Um, and he, he goes onto the city, to the people of the city, um, and he he speaks about them uh, and their and their evil ways, um, um, but it's 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 not something that he wants to do. Okay, so let's take a look at chapter four, which is the last chapter of Jonah, and we find out uh, one of the reasons why he didn't want to do it. It says, "But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, was not this my saying when I was yet in my own country? Therefore I fled before him unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God.'" and a compassionate long-suffering, and abundant in mercy, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore, take my life from me. For he's, He doesn't want, again, I don't want this kid. I don't want to do it. And God says to him rhetorically, are you very angry? <laughs> and that's my answer. This is not the first rhetorical question that isn't answered uh, in the text. Um, what is going on here? Um, it's not completely clear at first, but a number of critics have written about this, including Robert Alter and uh, Eric Brown um, in this recent book that I quite, quite like. Uh, on the book of Jonah, uh, who is actually an Orthodox uh, biblical scholar. Um, she uh, talks about it as well as Alter, and they, they, you know, they agree that what he's saying is, is that you're gracious and compassionate, and they don't deserve your grace and compassion. They're Ninevites. They're evil. Uh, he doesn't see it as God sees it. Um, he doesn't, God doesn't really want to accept the anger uh, from Jonah here. He's, he's small-minded. He doesn't want to save these people. He doesn't, even as he's doing it, even as he walks three days across the course of this city to try to try to save them, do what God does. He's reluctant every step of the way. He's pushing back against this task. Um, and it's this enormous city, kind of ridiculous that it could take three days to walk across it. That'd be way bigger than the city of Los Angeles in terms of acreage. Um, and God still doesn't kind of accept this, <clears throat> this, this resistance from Jonah. And so I'm going to end with the, the, the ending of the story. Uh, and it ends very interestingly. Um, he's in, he's in, he's walked across the cities in the midst of this, this process. Um, and it gives you this little anecdote about God grew this plant that produced a gourd and it, it, it puts him in the shade, but then, uh, God withers it. And Jonas says, why'd you do that? <laughs> Are you angry about the gourd? And, and as he's, God is creating a kind of parable here. And he says, well, didn't I? You know, you, you had pity for the gourd, which I just destroyed, which doesn't, which, you know, you don't have shade anymore, right? Um, 
which you didn't do it before. You didn't make it grow, perish in a day and a night. Shouldn't I have pity for the people of Nineveh, the great city? We're in our more than six score thousand persons um, that cannot discern between the right hand and their left and also much cattle. I don't know what to say about the cattle being saved, but uh, God is saying, you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm involved in your life, and I'm involved in protecting you. Um, and when things don't go well for you in your own little world, you know, you're, you're affected and you, you, you have pity for that which, that which could protect you and dies. Um, why not have pity for these people as bad as they are who don't know what they're doing? Uh, and there's no answer. God asks this question of Jonah, and we don't find out what, what Jonah says. And I think it's quite deliberate. We're left with we're left with this problem. We're left with the story unresolved. Um, we're left with these people potentially unsaved. Um, but the test the text leads you, you know, to want to, I think, I hope, uh, assert that it is this is your responsibility. This is Jonah's responsibility to help these people. The last thing I want to say about this then is I think the other than the kind of belly of the whale episode or belly of the fish, this kind of existential dilemma about how you can't escape God and God can save you from this feeling of being lost or sinful or death, which is appropriate for this, this, uh, this day. Um, it's also appropriate because the story places you in the position of the outsider. Uh, it is, you know, it goes even beyond uh, Leviticus, which, you know, tells you to, to you know, love, love thy neighbor as thyself. This is not your neighbor. These are the bad guys. These are the people who conquered um, most of your people and, and you lost them. These are the, the worst of the worst, the Assyrians. Uh, and here they don't get smited. Here they're worthy of being saved. Um, and so this is a text that looks back on that earlier biblical history, uh, earlier Israelite history, and says even these people are under the eyes of God. And it puts you... A Jew, a Jew, in the position of the complete outsider, um, and it comforts you. I, I hope, and says, "Aren't aren't you worthy?" You know, ask you, "Aren't you like it like the Assyrian here in your state of feeling alienated from God or feeling um, like you've done wrong? Aren't you also worthy of of um, forgiveness and salvation and all that good groovy stuff?" Um, and that's unique. And this goes much further than anything before or after in the Hebrew Bible in putting us in the position of the outsider. I think that's really beautiful. And therefore, I think the rabbis knew what they were doing uh, when they made this uh, a text that we read every Yom Kippur. Anyway, thanks very much. And um, see ya.